Hi. Hi, Piano. Hi. How are you? I'm good. What do you need to know? How much do you know? Or shall I just give you a little bit of a landscape real quick? Uh, I think a landscape would be very helpful. Um, okay. And also, if you could just tell me how this year is going as well, how the harvest was, and you're putting wines into Elevage now. How is that going? It's a, it's a fantastic opportunity to be humbled this year. Uh, so it started very good. We had a, I felt a, a very homogeneous flowering season. Um, we had a couple of strong frosts that were a little bit more uh, pronounced than what we're used to. That means that we lost, on an average, 15% of our grapes in certain vineyards. Um, luckily the frost was fairly premature and so we could have lost a lot more, but it came earlier on. At Chakra, one thing that the team is incredibly great at, it's managing frost. We have a very sophisticated, but yeah, in a way it is sophisticated. We have a very sophisticated system of mist. And so we have central pumps and we pump mist into the vineyard mm. and this is water that comes from underground so it comes up around 14 degrees and that creates heat in the vineyard and the, as the heat rises we're, we're fighting the cold with warm water because we're certified organic and biodynamic and i felt that we needed to find a different way than to burn stuff in the vineyards you know I, or, or instead me, of using sprinklers as well you will use these mists coming from underground yeah i mean we would use Basically, for me to create, burn something that is a petroleum derivate to create thick smoke to fight frost did not sit well by me. And so I went and looked for alternative way. This year I'm buying a couple of vents. They're like gigantic rotors. One can take up to five hectares in terms of coverage. And so maybe 12 years ago, I installed a a super strong system of, of it's like between mist and a light sprinkle, you know, mm. and that works very, very well. Of course, if it goes a minus six for five hours, it's limited what you can do. You know, it's like, you're not going to win the battle every time, but because we have frost on spring every year due to the fact that we're in a desert, it's very typical. And so we're equipped for this and the guys are very good. So we had, uh, slightly precocious flowering, very even. We lost some of our grapes to the frost, in certain cases, 15%. We were coming super strong. It was close to perfect vintage in terms of weather. Then we had a heat wave around Christmas. And, um, and the Chardonnay was picked at the most incredible moment. Jean-Marc by mistake, I mean, by mistake, you can't quite predict, came in uh, 10 days earlier than picking. And that gave him the opportunity to, you know, oversee everything and really pick all the white Chardonnay vineyards. I felt the best we've picked in a, since the beginning in terms of the timing. Of course, I started this venture in 17 for the Chardonnay. So mind you, it, it takes a little bit to figure out the kinks and the fine tuning, you know, it's, and and so the for the whites, I think potentially the best vintage we've ever made in 2022. Then, as we stopped picking the whites, we have 65 millimeters of water smack in the middle of the harvest of the reds. And so, you know, I this year we started to pick the reds before the whites. We have ungrafted genetic material that it's not on an American rootstock, which I think allows us to pick early and reach phenolic ripeness earlier than the typical, you know, American rootstock. Mind you, everything I tell you is not the truth. These are just experiences. So whether I'm telling you it's true or not, I have no clue. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm more of a, like a creative director and I'm more of a empirical, uh, observation kind of a self-made guy that's why in the winery this year i had literally six enologists you know for me the idea is like if you're going to have brain surgery stick six surgeons in the room let one operate and oversee it 
and mm-hmm. you're minimizing every little detail that can go wrong. So we have in-house, we have this year, we had four enologists in-house. Then I can talk to you about my structure and how it works. And then two enologists that came from outside plus another four interns. So we're very, we're very, you know, we, we cover a little bit all ends, but at the end of the day, it's really a creative process trying to avoid the large technical mistakes, you know, because that's a little bit the idea. So we finished to pick the white 62 millimeters of water spanned over 48 hours. Luckily, and this is where the kids that came here, they were like flabbergasted. As soon as it stopped raining, wind picks up. So no idiom developed whatsoever, even though 62 millimeters is a ton of water. And we had to wait for the soil to absorb it. Because, you know, typically within two days, the root system starts to drink a lot. And then at that stage, your, your berries can get a little diluted. So that beautiful natural concentration and the energy you had, you need to wait it again for it. Okay, so you might pick up half to one degree more in alcohol unless you want to start really making winemaking, which we don't do. And you have to really work the wine and working on evaporating the water. But we don't do this because if you look at our observation sheet, it's empty. So if you come to Chakra and you look at every single vat, in the column addition and observation, there's nothing because we make wines without anything. So we don't work the wines. We don't have that technology. You know, Everything is pretty much by gravity and, and we work in a very artisanal way. So the only call was to wait. We waited. And I think the vineyards that had a higher percentage of sand did really, really, really well. The other ones are more floral because the vineyards that have a higher component of clay, they had water retention that lasted a little longer than the sand because the sand just goes down. And then with the wind, it's very quick. But clay keeps water for a longer period of time. So we had a little bit to wait a little longer. And as a consequence of that, we couldn't pick this, this early that I typically do for 35 to 38% of what was left. And this transformed itself to high pH. And because we don't do anything in our wine, the second portion was really game on. I called a meeting. I told them all of my worries and my concerns. And I said, this is one of the vintages that we really have to be very good. We really have to be very good. And, and They also have higher alcohol, the reds from 2022. Yeah, they might have 0.7 higher, but sometimes our whites are, are red. They're between 12 and 12 and a half. Mm, yeah. So, you know, Chakra for being in a very, because everybody thinks Patagonia is super cold. This is super hot here. During the harvest, you go from 40 to one, <laughs> you know, so you have 40 degrees amplitude and, and it can be super hot. So, but we've done so much work to mitigate the circumstances. You know, I planted 45,000 trees. So I reduced every parcel to a hectare and a half to increase the shade and to, and to increase foliage to diminish temperatures at night, further protect against the wind. And, and then with our crop in place that we started this practice, you know, we were organic and biodynamic at inception. So we've been doing this for 20 years now. Mm-hmm. And what we do is we do a, a soil analysis. You know, we already mapped all our vineyards with Pedro Parra, which is a geologist from, from Chile that has this technology that harnessed some, no- some knowledge from the petroleum company. And basically, you do a, an electrical conduction of the soil to understand if you have all these minerals. And in, based on this reading, you can get an understanding if you're ever going to get to that style of wine or not, because you either have the minerals or not. So... I want to jump off into the landscape of, of why and who and what and where. My, you know, I'm Italian. I come from a winemaking family. My grandfather started uh, to make some little production to drink at home in the early 40s. Turns out to be this crazy story about Sassicaia. I sort of got introduced into wine by him because as kids, he always drank a lot of Burgundy and Bordeaux and some Piedmontese wine. And I developed 
a taste of an old man at a younger age. But I think more than a taste of a man, I caught the end of an era in terms of style because it was the pre-Parker area. So mm. wines, you know, Cabernet was called Claret because it was a light in color and, and so on and so forth. And was more often than not, you drank at wine 11 and a half and 12 than anything else. Acidity was high and it went very well with the, the food of those times. I'm 54. So imagine, you know, 35 years ago or 40 years ago, there's a lot more French food, uh, you know, all these things didn't exist. So that's, that's the wine that I like in terms of stylistically. I worked for my family for many decades and I decided to start my own venture. I went to Oregon, California, and Italy to try to find some Pinot holdings as well as Burgundy. And for a million different reasons, I decided to come to Patagonia. I tried a Pinot blind in New York in 2002. I thought the wine was delicious, very fruity, you know, it had some Pinot, it had some New World, it had some Old World. There was something interesting there. And so I took a plane. I came here without speaking the language, with not a pen in my pocket. And I was held by a cousin of mine. I did a lot of research. I found this abandoned vineyard. I rented on a handshake and I made wine for two years as an experiment. First vintage was 1,330 bottles. And I started by, I wanted to do this project. I had amassed a collection of watches that I sold in New York on, to a jeweler. And with that money that I had made during my work as a banker in my younger years, I financed this project. And then I found two American investors that believed in me and we started the winery. How much wine production was there in the region in Patagonia? So in 1967 which was my year of birth, there were over 2,000 hectares of Pinot. Imagine that. When I got here in 2002, I think they were down to 160. Well, why? So we've been doing... It, it's, a, it's a smart and yet super complex question because if you don't know Argentina, it, it's sometimes it's challenging to understand it. At least it was for me. They have everything here. And for a series of reasons that I'm not completely clear on, they lost everything. This was the sixth largest economy on the planet. Today is a third world country. We have an inflation at 45%. What I think happened is that the consumption per capita was maybe like nine liters. Or no, I'm sorry. It was like 55 liters per capita. And then like everywhere else in the world, it dropped because... Agriculture was made an industrial business, so the farmers drank less. Remember, wine was calories. You know, every, every, every farmer in Europe, you saw an attractor at 5.30 in the morning, had a glass, had a bottle of wine with him to keep him warm and give him calories during the day. You know, they had coffee with grappa in the morning. It was very cold and the houses were not heated. And so when the consumption per capita dropped by more than half, this region sort of like almost went belly up. This region is apple, pears, and grapes. And so the torch was passed to Mendoza. Maybe Mendoza had the torch all along, but then they became like almost the single handlers of the torch. Mm. And people make less and less money. And as this vineyard was getting, were getting older, they ripped them out and they replaced them with apples and pears, which is more of a commodity. Are you seeing renewed interest? How, how far is the yeah. growth nowadays? But, you know, on, on, on some level, I'm a little bit disappointed because when I came here with the eyes of a European farmer, I thought I, I, thought I struck gold. There's nowhere else like here. It's insane. And I thought, wow, within two years, they're all going to come. The weather is perfect. There's no pollution. The, the humidity is at 35%. You have no pest, no disease, no bacteria, no tignola, no, no philosphera, no pronospera, no eat. You have nothing. You have no fungus. So no treatments. Last year, in half of my vineyards, we did one treatment. One. Doesn't, that's like crazy. We have a river that crosses this desert. The water comes from the Andes. It's clean and it's packed with minerals. And you're sitting with lime, sand, clay. And pebbles that are covered with calcareous matter. I'm like, 
what? And so then you have the flip side. You know, you need to be you need to be a gambler, I think, because forty five percent inflation it's it's a hard pill to swallow when you're American and or European. Are you seeing a lot of investment now into the region from wineries that are based further north? Minimal. I mean, I fly to, I go to France four or five times a year, the same thing to Italy. I don't see the same activity here. Mendoza, yes. Here, no. It's so odd. Because literally, it's so hard to make bad wine here. Like, nature really helps you. It's crazy. I always say to everyone, it's crazy. Like, the protagonist here is nature. And then we're lucky... I mean, we came here to do what we're doing because it's, it's only here that we can go to this extreme at this scale. It's where else with no chemicals. That, that's, that's what I'm talking about, you know? And so, and a genetic material that is insane. You know, hundred percent of our vineyards are, are, are not on American roots. So a hundred percent, this is just like unheard of. That's why the wines are what they are. It's just Gosh. odd. Odd because it's easy to make wine. When I see what we have to do in Italy, in Bulgaria, and when I see, you know, I planted a small vineyard, my mom died and she left me this beautiful property right next to Florence and I planted five hectares. I told to my friend who was doing this project with me, I said, this is never going to be as easy as Patagonia. This is like a dream, mm. a dream. For a winemaker is a dream. Like I have arrived if nothing else happens in my life, I feel like I won the lottery every single day. So, and the other thing, you know, I shouldn't say that every grape is great here. That's a crazy thing. You know, I... And so, so I'm you're focused you now on, year. on, on huh? Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. Is that purely a personal preference, do you think? Or do you think they are more suited? I don't think they're more suited. Oddly enough, what I've came to sort of like observe and taste. And then we did some experiments ourselves. It, there is a beautiful growing season for fruit period of the Mediterranean kind period. And all grapes, if they're worked in a certain way are beautiful. I just had Robert came in here was a friend of mine from, from Napa. I don't know if you know Robert came in. He's like a, He's a producer and he's also a, um, a movie writer. He, he did a lot of movies and whatever. And he has Syrah and we made a Syrah and he couldn't believe the Syrah that we make here. You know, I make a thousand bottles for, just for the fuck of it and we drink it here and we sell some yeah. to our private clients in Argentina. But we have lost, I think, the audacity to imagine that certain historic wine regions can only produce that grape. Now, if you want, I had the privilege to observe a man. I didn't observe him because I wasn't even born when he did his first vineyard. But my grandfather planted Cabernet Sauvignon in the Mecca of Sangiovese. And the result was Sassicaia. So we are so stuck in these preconceived formulas or these customs or sometimes, you know, tradition that we forget that maybe that can yield something else that is equally as good. You know, we, we, we lose that. Why? Oh, because there's an appellation, because it's, clients are expecting this, because my grandfather and my great-grandfather did that. Like, none of these reasons are good enough. And I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm just observing, you know. And so I think here, uh, when you hopefully you get to come, or I'll send you all the samples next year because slow. We try something for three years in a row before we ever gonna release it. So we are there third year. Oddly enough, you know the worst one was the Cabernet, so we're not gonna release it. But the Syrah is delicious. The Syrah is delicious. The Trousseau is amazing. The mm-hmm. Malbec, I'll try it with you. It's uh, we, I'm, I'm ch- I changed the style of Malbec from the rest of the country because I wanted to do the other direction. You know, like mm-hmm. I'm, I'm like. I'm dominated by my neurosis. So it's like, you know, I want to try different stuff all the time. So I made a Malbec that is more, I wanted to make it blue, blue Malbec. There was violets and, and, and here, like everything is possible. So it's for young, I'm not young, I'm re- but for a relatively young uh, winemaker here is a 
it's fun. Mm. It's fun. Of course, you have all sorts of pressure, but I'm used to pressure. I love pressure. I love chaos. Yeah, I'm Italian. We operate very well in chaos. They don't care. Yeah, like, Wonderful. When the mother of my kid is American, and she comes here and she loses her marble. She's like a super structured intelligent woman in here in the latin system it doesn't work the way you like but so yeah so by going back to us so the story of chakra is a story that is 18 years in the making we started with 1330 bottles of chakra 32 chakra 32 is a vineyard that is approximately two hectares then i bought three neighboring farms and bar that was born and then all the other wines, which are single vineyard wines. So we, we operate in a traditional way. Each vineyard makes a wine, except for bar that has more than one vineyard. Uh, the, the, we declassify, even though we're not within the classification, so this word doesn't fully apply, but just to give you an idea, we declassify the, the grapes from the top vineyard. They're not perfect. We put them into Barda to raise the quality of Barda. And sometimes we'll declassify some, something that is already in a lavage and we put it to Barda. So this gives mm. us the opportunity to make a, a better single vineyard wine, but also to better the quality of Barda. And also the, the, the atypical thing is that in our case, Barda vineyards are on an average 25 years old. So it's an entry level wine, but with, with a, an incredible age and is also ungrafted and blah, 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 everything else. Our method of fermentation is straightforward. We pick very early in the morning. Morning typically here is very cold during the harvest. We bring in the grapes and we put them directly into a cement vat. Uh, typically they're placed inside. They are between nine and 13 degrees. And then uh, we just wet the cap a little bit. We, we ferment typically with the, uh, mm, a large portion of whole cluster, not a hundred percent, depending on the vintage. I typically get here, start chewing on, on, on stems. And depending on the stringency and the maturity of the stems, we decide if we want to go in higher, we taste the grapes. So we put them in the cement vat at the third or fourth day, the yeast indigenous yeast kicks in. At that time, I start breaking the grapes because I want the indigenous yeast to colonize the whole vat because I don't use sulfur. And so if other yeasts are starting to come up, you can have a million deviation and you're not protected. So we, we try to, for our indigenous yeast to take over, colonize the vats as soon as possible. So we break some of these bunches and then typically ferments last between 10 days to two weeks, sometimes two weeks and a half. We do not typically do a remontage. We do typically light punch downs. Uh, sometime we'll just put some cold juice on top of the hat and we keep it that way. Of mm -hmm. course, uh, in order for us to get help, we have 200 beehives that are sprinkles around the farm in all the vineyard. And I started to implement them 17 years ago. I've never had a stuck fermentation. It's believed that the hives, they give you a renewed yeast every year. And so we planted you know, 6,000 plants of lavender, 7,000 plants of roses. We planted, like I said to you before, close to 38,000 trees. So we created an ecosystem to find this balance uh, in the vineyards for the bees as well. Of course, then the bees, they give us the bee wax, which you see on some of the bottles that you receive. That's mm -hmm. bee wax from the state. Every year we're making an effort to remove one or two items of petroleum derived product from the farm. And so I've eliminated most of the capsules and all of our packaging is friendly. We're not using glue. We're trying not to use tape. So we're trying to do two things. First of all, take care of, of the soils and the biodiversity and the ecosystem and take care of the community. These are the, the two things that are important for us. You know, the kids of our employees, school, we buy them backpacks, books, some people need to be her done, her teeth redone, because even though we're in a socialistic country, their programs are terrible. And so that's that. Typically, our, our vats do not go over uh, 22 to 23 degrees. We want to ferment around 20. And at the end, we let the vat go and can reach 25, 26. So fermentation in a relatively cooler environment 
by picking very early, typically where the first pick, the grapes come in in 11 and a half, almost 12. And so when you're lower in alcohol, of course, fermentation can go smoother and also typically pH stay low with that's the problem of chakra is constantly Mm -hmm. we have to be on the lookout for pH. Uh, What changes in terms of the fermentation vats, they're all the same round shape. They're very shallow. And so the wine is, the must is always pretty much more submerged. The the hat is more in the must than a typical vat because it's supposed to be tall and and, and narrow. It's very wide and 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 it's shallow. Why did I did this? Because I don't want to extract. I don't really care about the color, even though here it's so windy that my skins are thick. So the color is really driven by the strong winds that hit the skins and they become a little thicker. And that's also why these aromatics. But in, in, in doing so, I, I don't extract. It's more of a bleeding of the grapes. So it's more of like an emitting, like by infusion, than by, you know, going through a pump or doing something like that. When you feel, when you feel, feel that the vat is dry, very quick, separate the must, we press the skins. If, if the press is very good, most of the time we might go in the wine directly. If not, we can keep it separate and then we'll add it at the end. Straightforward. Mm-hmm. Elevage is divided in three. We use cement. For 30%, typically on most of the wines, some wines like Barda is up to 50%, and the and the Malbec is 100%. Then we use used oak. Our oak is, on all the cuvee single vineyards, our oak is three plus years old. Mm. And so the new oak, like we buy every year, maybe 20, 25 barrels, the new oak is used only in, in Barda because it gets lost. Because when you pick at 12 and your wines are not tannic and you have this luminosity and your wine have a tendency to be a little bit more floral and you, you don't have that autumn that comes in early like in Piedmont or in Burgundy, you, um, you know, your wines have a tendency to be fresher, more flowery. And also something that I forgot to tell you is that when we go into Elevage, Nine, 9.9 times out of 10, mallow has already happened. Because when you're using no sulfur, typically mallow comes right in because okay. you're not killing it. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Because yeah. when you're putting sulfur, you're killing the bad, but you're killing the good. You're killing everything. It's like cancer treatment. They kill your body to bring you back to life, you know? And so... As opposed to stripping down of these billion things, when you leave it all there, sometime, typically, before the first is finished, mallow kicks right in. Okay. Uh, thank you, Piero. It's late for you. Um, lovely thank to you. meet you. Same here. Okay, be well. Have a great day. Thank you so much. Thank you and you. Ciao.